Level 1. You're in your final year of high school and you have no clue what to do next. Uni is coming fast and you have ruled out anything with numbers. You think you have a natural talent for reading people. Whenever you're in social situations, you love mapping out people. You think you can tell with some surprising accuracy what their traumas are, when they are projecting and when they are lying. Sometimes it makes you feel emotionally connected. Other times it makes you feel superior. You took an online MBTI quiz and you're an INFP. Obviously, you knew that before the quiz told you. That has to mean you're good at this. You not only have a high IQ, but a high EQ as well. At this point, you're literally made to study psychology. It seems interesting, plus you have your own fair share of mental problems. So you can probably learn some tricks to fix your own issues as well. And most importantly, it pays well, right? Level 2. You get to uni and find out that it's much harder to become a psychologist than you thought. But you're committed now. You start taking the DSM as Holy Scripture and CBT as the Holy Grail. You also start doing your own research. You go into YouTube rabbit holes and psychology TikTok. You start casually dropping things like avoidant dismissive and maladaptive thought patterns in your group chats. You start understanding the world through pop psychology language. Your ex was a narcissist who gaslit you and you exhibit a Machiavellian personality. You daydream about creating the perfect human. Project Mbappe, fuck that, Project Skinner. At this time, you also learn about Jung and Freud as the guys who made psychology weird, one's obsessed with moms and the other with mystical archetypes. Level 3. Your education really starts to shape your worldview. Now it's all about neurons, neurotransmitters and neural pathways. You stop believing in souls, or at least you stop thinking they're relevant to psychology. What's a soul compared to the serotonin transporter gene? At this point, you start viewing the mind as a biological machine. Inputs, outputs, circuits, feedback loops. Feelings, that's just dopamine regulation, love and oxytocin cocktail. Depression, a chemical imbalance. You really get into CBT and evolutionary psychology. You start seeing everything with respect to its survival function. Jealousy, aggression, even guilt. They're just survival and reproductive tools. Your education also teaches you that psychoanalysis is history and CBT is progress and you only need pharmaceutical drugs to fix your mental illness. Level 4. You revisit Freud and this time you see more than just a guy obsessed with mothers. His writing starts to make an uncomfortable kind of sense. You're not fully on board with Jung. He's a bit too mystical and not scientific enough but his theories are interesting. They have some poetic value to you. At this stage, the cracks start to show in your clinical science brain worldview. CBT might just be a bandage and medicine just a sedative. You might need something else to get to the root problem. You're slowly escaping the bias of your education. Level 5. You start looking beyond clinical studies, beyond the data, beyond biology. You stop believing in a total biological model of the mind. The brain isn't just a machine gone wrong. It's a vessel for something more. Metaphysics creeps in. And surprisingly, it doesn't feel like pseudoscience anymore. It feels necessary. Suddenly, Jung becomes palatable. His symbolism, his collective unconscious, his mythological leanings, it clicks now. He wasn't being unscientific. He was trying to speak about things that science couldn't teach. You begin to believe that maybe mental illness isn't illness at all. Not in the way we talk about it at least. Depression, anxiety, despair. These aren't bugs in the system, they're features. A perfectly reasonable response to a world like this. You are, after all, a conscious being trapped in a decaying, vulnerable meat suit where everything is trying to kill you or outcompete you. If anxiety isn't a natural reaction to this condition, you don't know what is. Mental health becomes less about fixing and more about understanding. You no longer see therapy as symptom management. You see it as meaning making. The self is no longer something to fix, but something to study. Level 6. You discover Lacan. Language doesn't just describe reality, it constructs it. Your unconscious isn't just suppressed urges, it's structured like a language. At this stage, you also feel torn. Psychoanalysis itself starts to seem like another cage. You begin to question if CBT, DCM and diagnosis were just ways to tame something untamable. You learn that repression exists, but is it necessary? What if true reality is seen from letting it go, even if it means risking madness? Something inside wants to break free, even if there is something frightening lurking on the outside. Level 7. At this point, you're back where you started. You don't really know anything, except that the human mind cannot be known. So you embrace it all. 
you explore tantric practices to explore the soul. The left hand path, the right hand path, the loose and guitar return as guides towards the frightening territory of schizophrenia. Perhaps this is the truth without repression. You revisit Jung, this time with reverence. Myth, dreams, symbols, they all start to make sense now. The primitive mind becomes your teacher. Yet you don't abandon science. You start exploring facial morphology, more evolutionary psychology and even fringe theories. Everything becomes connected. You don't seek truth anymore, you seek synthesis. And somehow that feels like clarity.